Welcome everyone. My name is Astrid Edwards. Uh, this is the first Between the Lines series from the Melbourne UNESCO City of Literature. It is extremely exciting to be here. Our first guest today is Grace Chan. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I live and work. I am on the lands of the Jajawarung people, which means I am in a little town about an hour north of Melbourne. The UNESCO City of Literature itself and our guest today, Grace Chan, is located in Melbourne, uh, which means they are living and working on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Boon peoples. Uh, I pay respects to their elders, past and present, and I acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. It is really exciting to be here with you today. I'm going to briefly introduce myself as this is the first uh, Between the Lines series. My name is Astrid Edwards. Um, I am your host today because I think writers are the best people on the planet. I teach writing at RMIT University. I, uh, for my sins, have recently enrolled in a PhD at the University of Melbourne, uh, exploring barriers to publishing climate fiction. I host a literary podcast called The Garrett, where I talk to writers all the time. And this year, I'm a judge of one of Australia's largest national uh, prizes for writers, the Stella Prize. Uh, so with that very brief introduction, uh, I would like to introduce everybody to Grace. Hello, Grace. So, Hello. Grace Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it is a pleasure. Um, Grace is a speculative fiction writer um, uh, of fiction and short form fiction. Grace's short form fiction is well published and, and highly awarded. But I think today um, we're going to focus on uh, your first novel, Every Version of You. Now, this came out in 2022 and we're recording this in 2023 and um, every version of you has been nominated for several really large prizes in Australia. Uh, Longlisted for the Stella Prize, which is the national uh, prize for uh, women's and non-binary writing in Australia. And also just this week, uh, shortlisted for the New South Wales Premier's Prize uh, for Fiction, which is the Christina Steed Prize for Fiction, uh, and is also eligible in those prizes for the People's Choice Award. So, you know, to our international audience, firstly, um, uh, Grace has really uh, made an impression with her debut novel, um, and those prizes are really quite meaningful. So, Grace, my first question to you, can you introduce us to every version of you just because our international audience is unlikely to have read it just yet? Yeah, thank you so much, Astrid, for acknowledgement. Thank you for that very kind introduction. <laughs> it's all still feeling a little bit surreal to me, especially the um, the recent awards uh, listing. <laughs> so yes, this is my debut novel. Uh, it's every version of you, and it is a literary novel. Although it it started off just as a geeky idea in my brain. <laughs> um, the premise. So I have often described this a bit tongue in cheek as a book about how to stay in love and feel real after mind uploading into virtual reality. <laughs> so that's the short pitch. It's a book that's set in late 21st century Australia and also in a very immersive, shiny, um, tempting virtual reality world called Gaia. It centers on a couple. So the main character is Tao Yi, who is a Malaysian Chinese uh, woman in her 20s, and her partner Naveen, um, who is of mixed heritage um, and migrates from the US to Australia to be with Tao Yi. Um, and the story is about their relationship and how things evolve as the world plunges more and more into virtual reality. Everything takes place there. They live there, they work there, they eat there, they go out to parties. There. Um, and how each of them respond to the migration of humanity into the virtual the virtual reality world of Gaia. And obviously things come to a head when a new technology is introduced to completely sort of transport a human being into Gaia um, and how you has to kind of grapple with what is most important to her, what makes her feel, um, you know, whole as an individual, her ties with Naveen, her love for Naveen, her ties with her mother, um, who in particular has 
you know, clings to the physical world and to her heritage in many ways. Um, and also Tao Yu's own ties to her body and to the physical world and to the natural environment that she sees changing and um, fading away around her. So it's a story grappling with change, really. Yeah. That's it. That's every version of you. <laughs> uh, look, look, there's a lot in there. Uh, one of the things that strikes me with this novel is you interrogate so many contemporary themes. Uh, like so many, not just kind of one, two or three, but I mean, there are layers to this novel, which means someone can bring um, their ideas of health and the body or their ideas of technology and change or their ideas of the climate crisis and, um, you know, postulate what our future might be. Why did you choose, I mean, I, I love speculative fiction. It is my deeply happy place. I read everything, but speculative fiction holds a really special place in my heart, but why did you choose, you know, the medium, the genre of speculative fiction um, to be how you wanted to express yourself and this story? Mm. I don't even think it was a good choice for me. So like you, I absolutely love speculative fiction. And like many speculative fiction fans, I've always grown up reading a lot of speculative fiction. So I think that's where it all started. My my lifelong passion <laughs> for speculative fiction. And as I got more into writing more seriously in the last few years, um, began reading more widely in terms of short and long form speculative fiction, I was especially inspired by a number of contemporary speculative fiction writers who were doing just remarkable things with the exploration of ideas um, and hypotheticals but lending it such a deeply human, intimate, personal focus. And so I, reading was one thing that really inspired my own work. I've often thought about how my reading and my writing are very much in a circular conversation and I'm constantly inspired by what other writers are doing. That sucks my own creativity. I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to do that too. I want to be awesome as you know these writers that are, that are doing putting out this awesome work out there so that's definitely one thing that's a constant inspiration for me I think also specifically with this novel uh, it was always going to be speculative fiction and I think I'm always going to be a speculative fiction writer at heart I find that it's such a joy to marry wonder and that sense of what if um, in writing, I find it such a delight and joy to take a hypothetical and explore the implications on a very intimate personal level. So how, you know, for example, with, um, with this novel, the core technology that we're thinking about is virtual reality and the hypothetical of uploading a mind into virtual reality and, you know, that's been explored a lot in fiction and in media before. You know, I thought, um, and it was quite scary to kind of grapple with this in my novel, but I thought, you know, let's let's just, you know, get really stuck into it and think about what are the really intimate personal implications of it? How would it change someone's sense of self, how they hold themselves together, how they hold their self-narrative together? How would it change how we relate to each other? How does being in the digital world change the way we conceive each other, the way we are intimate with each other, the way we, um, you know, conceive our pay image, um, how it change our relationship with health and healthcare and pain and comfort and pleasure. <laughs> and, yeah, all of that kind of would change maybe how society looks a little bit, I'm sure. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think speculative fiction is such a fun and exciting and vast medium to explore ideas that aren't just you know off in the future um, but very relevant to, to to what we're feeling and thinking and grappling with today yeah I could not agree more I'm struck by um you know in your explanation which you know is a beautiful articulation of what speculative fiction is 
and can do. But also, you know, every version of you, uh, it, it's essentially a love story. And a lot of the words that you just used, um, you know, it's focusing on, on, on the feeling on how, um, uh, you know, relationships between people um, and relationships to, to the body and to the change around us. Um, <laughs> For those of you watching, Grace is also a psychiatrist. Um, and I wanted to kind of ask how much of your kind of other professional life and your, you know, training kind of informed that very human exploration of, you know, what it means to feel. Mm. Yeah. I think both my profession, like my medical work as a psychiatrist and my evolve and influence each other and probably both evolve a little bit about uh, from my fascination with people <laughs> and minds and the self and, and what drives us as individuals and hold ourselves together so I I, I like the idea of narrative identity so the stories that we tell ourselves to give us a sense of who we are as a person and that's something that I get to explore in both my medical work and in my writing. Um, yeah, and I think that it definitely, you know, this this kind of evolved as I was going through my psychiatry training. So working in the hospital system and learning about the brain and the mind and at the same time evolved over the span of a few years. So there were certainly things that I was seeing and doing in my everyday work that made me brew on how I could layer what I was reflecting on into the novel. So I think the novel reflects my evolution over a few years of, um, <laughs> you know, things I was grappling with in what I was seeing around me, you know, my feelings about relationships, my feelings about identity, my feelings about how we relate to technology, I guess more specifically, there were a couple of things that led into the novel. So, you know, one thing I was thinking about was on a more T granular level, how the brain is constructed. And, you know, centuries ago, we had a very simplistic anatomical view of the brain where, you know, this specific, specific part of the brain um, holds this particular function. Speech is here and face recognition is here and the visual centers are here and it's all kind of concrete and stuck forever and it's just divided up like that. And if you have a big forehead here, this means that you have a personality. But I think we've moved a long way from that now. And recently there's been a lot of shift towards thinking about the brain as a very dynamic entity with a lot of plasticity, um, things like, you know, the Human Connectome Project are looking at mapping particular circuits in the brain um, related to conditions of de um, dementia and mental health conditions. So that was really exciting to learn about how dynamic the brain is. And that kind of bled into my hypotheticals around, hey, if the brain is sort of like software, then what if you could replace all the squishy brain matter with, you know, digital circuitry and essentially make a digital copy of the human mind. Um, I guess the other thing that I was, um, one other thing that I was thinking about as I wrote this novel was um, I was learning quite a bit about psychotherapy and I was reading this particular book. So it's called The Digital Age on the Couch um, by Alessandra Lemmer, who is a psych psychotherapist. And she writes... It's a slim little volume, but it's, um, it's remarkable and it's sort of articulated so many thoughts about how ourselves are already in digital space and how digital spaces allow us to explore aspects of ourselves that are buried or unconscious um, in very powerful and so, uh, you know, life changing ways. So, that was a remarkable read and, yeah, bled into my ideas about how digital spaces interact with ourselves and my fondness writing for exploring the things that drive us without knowing that they are driving us, so that our unconscious drives. <laughs> um, the idea of, you know, what the digital space 
you know, I mean, we're essentially occupying a part of the digital space right now. You know, the idea of what that means to us, I think, is something that we're all going to grapple with for the rest of our lives. And you have begun kind of like an interrogation of it for us in every version of you. Um, I've been reading up on you, Grace, uh, in preparation for this interview. <clears throat> and I know that um, you previously cited Oliver Sacks as... Um, you know, a writer um, and a thinker of great influence for you. And I was wondering, you know, he wrote um, nonfiction and creative nonfiction. Um, what, you know, as a writer and a medical professional, you know, what is the role of um, fiction and creative nonfiction uh, for all of us in understanding, um, you know, health and our minds and, you know, where they might go um, in this world of technology? Yeah, I'm a little bit biased, but I think fiction is irreplaceable, it's so powerful. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, reading is such a powerful medium to expand understanding of um, other people and of ourselves. So, I mean, I do keep my writing and my medical work separate in many ways, um, but I think fiction is important. I feel like fiction is really important for me personally in a in terms of writing it allows me to grapple with the the messy thoughts I have about people and the world and like make sense of what I'm feeling about what I'm doing so I think we it allows a space for you to reflect and explore your own responses to your own complicated responses and complicated feelings to things that you're seeing and doing. And I think that's such an important thing to have in your life, whether that's through writing or through some other kind of practice to have space to create um, reaction and consciousness and awareness of things that are going on in your life, <laughs> whether they're internal or external forces, um, you know, the world's changing so rapidly. <laughs> um, so I think fiction allows a space um, both through reading and writing to grapple with, yeah, you know, our emotional responses to things and that awareness gives us um, the room to make conscious choices about how we're responding to big things that are happening um, in our lives and around us. I uh, I, I also am a strong believer yeah, that reading, I think it's scientifically proven, right, that reading in, increases your empathy, <laughs> you're a more empathetic person in general. And yeah, I, I, I'm all for that. <laughs> I feel like that's very true. I think anyone watching this uh, is all for reading. Absolutely. Grace, you know, in yeah. to yeah. Oliver Sacks, you know, you've um, also, <clears throat> sorry, You've also previously talked about being influenced by, you know, some of the greats of speculative fiction, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro, um, Ursula Le Guin, and, you know, <coughs> sorry, people. Um, in addition to those, you know, famous speculative fiction writers, like they're international and people watching this will have, um, you know, heard their names and read their works. As a young, um, you know, writer of speculative fiction in Australia, how do you kind of, you know, build on that canon and place your work in the future, but so clearly in Australia and so clearly in Melbourne. Um, you know, as you, I read every version of you, you know, you were talking about streets. I walk every day when I'm at work. Um, it's very kind of place-based um, for a, a significant chunk of the novel. And I guess, you know, how do you write the physicality of Australia and Melbourne? into that speculative fiction, you know, canon? Mm. Oh, that's a lovely question. Thank you. Um, I feel like I, as a writer, I'm, I'm both a very visual writer and a very tactile writer. So um, as I write, I often have a very strong visual image of the scene that's unfolding. Um, and that, that, I think, really great in what's happening but the prose that I use I find that I um, kind of embody my characters so I I feel their bodily sensations in my body, right and I 
find that I convey that a lot in my prose. Sometimes I even have to go back like, oh, I think I've talked about bodily sensations too many times in this paragraph. Maybe I'll cut one or two. Um, but I find that um, tactile and somatic descriptions are things that I uh, convey a lot in my writing. And I, I, I enjoy that. I think that allows the reader to maybe, yeah, like you said, get a real feel for the environment that I'm writing. So hopefully though I'm writing two generations into the future in a in a devastated kind of ravaged Australia. And also I'm writing a completely fictional invented uh, in virtual world <laughs> that doesn't exist at all. I hope that, you know, I think there's an L to it that's very tactile and makes you feel like you can feel all the sensations that Taoyi's feeling, especially as she's doing things like, you know, um, climbing into the the special pods that will have gel to to actually interface with the virtual world. I wanted to make it so that you really feel all the gel squelching on her and get the nooks and crannies and the 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 physicality of that experience um and I guess the other uh, other you know embodied experiences that she has like wandering through um Melbourne wearing her you know her climate gear battling against the elements um and I guess her relationship with Naveen too wanted to convey the embodied element of that the tactile element the smell so that when it changes and when it becomes a relationship that's mediated through the virtual medium, um, you also feel that change. So yeah, I really enjoy playing with sensations in 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 my writing. It's sort of like another language that you layer on uh, to the narrative. This whole the way that the sensation of the character and the way she feels the world around her and that she feels her own body um, changes throughout the novel. I hope that answers your question. It does. <laughs> Not it a little does. bit of a tangent. <laughs> it does. Um, I have a follow-up question though. Um, you know, this is two generations in the future. It's in the kind of 2080s um, around then and the world um, has experienced and is continuing to experience a dramatically changed climate. I mean, you're writing in the future and therefore you kind of have a lot of freedom, right? Um, but also it's not very far in the future and you need to make it believable for your reader, right? Your, your reader needs to buy into it. And I wanted to kind of ask about your approach to world building and your approach to, you know, presenting a version of our potential future, you know, my specific potential future in Melbourne, which is not very nice. Um, how did you get that onto the page? Mm. Oh my gosh, it was a difficult time period to write in. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> definitely not. I could, one thing I could not see myself doing is writing historical fiction. Hats off to everyone who writes historical fiction. The amount of research and world building is just, oh, it's very impressive. <laughs> Spectre fiction is easier because you get to make stuff up as you said um but yeah so I mean every version of you actually initially set further in the future so I set it um in the late 22nd century in the very early drafts but then I brought it back to the um in the first century so only about 50 years from now um or 50 or 60 years from now mainly because I felt the story needed to be closer and as I was writing it I felt that the thing I was kind of uh the scenes and the feelings that were coming through in the novel felt really close to today and um the way that we kind of interact with technology, technology today so I just felt that yeah it it needed to be closer to today. Yes, it is set in the 2080s and that made it a lot harder to rejig it in many ways because as you said, I had to kind of form closer links with what's going on today um, and make it 
make a semi-believable trajectory from today to 50 years from now because it's actually not that far so in my own you know in the depths of my fold on my computer I have quite a few word building documents and I can be quite a geek with the world building I have a lot of fun <laughs> plotting away and filling out um little um spreadsheet and documents of um <laughs> background about the world so it's it's not a particular complicated it's just about sitting and imagining um yeah I guess I was trying to go with how I feel about change in our relationships and also how I feel about change in the world around us that's you know, the two main themes in the novel are technological change and climate change. And alongside technological change, there's definitely the change in um, healthcare and how healthcare is delivered and um, the amount of care um, is that is in our systems of medicine. So I was, in terms of the world building, I was just kind of taking my thoughts and feelings about what I saw around me today and extrapolating, you know, two generations from now. So there are some pessimistic elements, but I hope there are some optimistic elements too. <laughs> there are some elements that are quite bleak because there are some things that I feel about the world around me that are, that I dislike or that make me feel uneasy or about the future. Um, but I also hope that there are some hopeful or more positive elements woven in into the novel as well. <laughs> like any good speculative fiction, there's both, right? Like the future holds promise, but it also holds a great deal of pain and disaster as well. I want to take a step back from your actual work, every version of you, and ask you a question about, um, you know, what it takes to get published, but also given our audience is international like kind of the Australian publishing industry as part of, you know, the broader international public publishing industry. So, I mean, um, for context, for those watching, um, speculative fiction is huge, um, you know, ha has huge sales around the world cumulatively, but in Australia, um, we buy it, we import it, but we kind of publish less of it. And that is starting to change in the kind of the last, you know, five to 10 years, but it's a recent development. So my question, Grace, is, you know, when you're writing speculative fiction and you, you know, you want to sell it, you want to publish it, you want to share your story, how do you kind of navigate Australia being a little bit slow in this particular area? <laughs> it's really tricky. And I feel like I'm only just starting to figure out the answers and I don't have many. <laughs> Um, and I learn a lot from like more experienced little fiction writers around me, um, particularly ones writing in Australia. But from my own experience, I started out with very, very little knowledge of the literary landscape. Um, you know, five years ago, I was working as a doctor and, you know, zero about what publishing looked like in Australia <laughs> um, and internationally. So it was tricky. And I guess the thing I actually started off with was fiction because I felt like that was a little bit of an easier entry point into the world of speculative fiction. Um, as many of you might know, you know there's a very... A vibrant international speculative fiction community with lots of amazing um, magazine publications um, around the world and lots more cropping up that uh, are publishing really awesome, diverse, um, mind-bending stories. <laughs> so I really got into reading um, and also submitting speculative short fiction and that was yeah, it was a really nice entry point because I was able to submit to both Australian magazines like Aurealis and Andromeda Spaceways and also submit internationally, so to magazines like Clark's World, uh, Oreo, Strange Horizons, many, many more out there, um, and start to get my stuff published. And it's nice when you're starting that to get a couple of acceptances and be like, hey, I can, I can do this. <laughs> Um, so that was my little 
entry point into um, writing speculative fiction and it helped me to fall in love um, more and more with the short form um, and short stories. Um, and actually every version of you did start off as a short story, it grew into a novelette and a novella and eventually a novel. With long form fiction, that was that a was, um, trickier thing. So as you said, like speaking to others more recently, it's definitely um, seems to be the experience that it's really hard to um, get much attention to political fiction in Australia. And a lot of really on Australian specific writers are publishing internationally because they can reach a much bigger audience for their work, um, which is a little bit sad. It is. Um, it's really sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I would love to see speculative fiction get much more attention and love in Australia. And I feel like it's maybe in the past few years starting to. And I think that's really exciting. So I feel like I've started to write at a time that's very exciting in Australia, that I want to kind of jump on board this wave and kind of stir up some foam and be like, yeah, speculative fiction can do some really awesome things and Australian speculative fiction too. And we can publish it in Australia and people will read it. People are already reading lots and lots of speculative fiction. It's just not getting as much attention in the literary sphere. So yeah. When I was looking for um, someone to read and publish my novel, <laughs> I went to agent because I need someone to kind of guide me through the literary world, <laughs> hold my hand a little bit. <laughs> um, but I also really felt that with this novel in particular, it's set in Australia. It's about a you know people who are members of the various diaspora communities, but they. Uh, now their lives are grounded very much in Australia as well. Um, I really hoped that it would reach an Australian audience um, and it could be published in, uh, you know, here and kind of, yeah, um, be a little, uh, a, a little as Aussie spectator elements of um, <laughs> characters from multi-ethnicities and tell a different kind of Australian story. Yeah. yeah. Um, look, I love it, right, clearly. Um, you mentioned prizes and um, that, you know, in Australia, uh, speculative fiction tends to kind of um, not be chosen in prizes even if the works are eligible for entry. That, um, uh, you know, is true every year. It's quite obvious if you look at the the national and very large state based prizes, um, you know, for literature in Australia. Um, I was a judge of the Seller Prize this year, and you know, like this is on the long list, and I feel really proud that it's on the long list because that happens so infrequently. Um, it's it's not common, I guess. What are your like? apart from kind of noting um, that, you know, speculative fiction doesn't make it to the prizes in Australia, like how do you feel as a member and a representative, I guess, of the speculative fiction community in Australia? Like what do we need to change? And, you know, again, noting our international audience, is anyone doing this better? <laughs> oh, gosh. I think that things... I would love to see things change, honestly. I feel like there is still a lot of bias against speculative fiction in Australia, unfortunately. There's such a, um, <laughs> there's a bit of snobbery that you know, speculative fiction is genre and it's just, you know, it's indulgent and it's, you know, just about, it can't explore deeper themes and it's just about gratifying your, it, it's, it's escapism and gratification. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is so untrue um, and I feel like in order to maybe get attention on prizes you kind of need to have a more literary bent literary bent to your writing um, whereas I think that that dichotomy is very false and there's so much crossover in terms of genres I feel like genres um, you know uh, they kind of hold you back in terms of your writing and reading so you know, when I wrote every version of you, I was just setting out to write 
like I, I thought yeah I'm gonna write a sci-fi novel it's a sci-fi novel <laughs> and then someone said oh you've written literary sci-fi you can you can you know get published here and you you might do okay <laughs> Can you explain? Uh, I mean, it's such a strange thing, and I'm I, I don't know if uh, this term exists abroad or not. I honestly don't know. But this kind of the publishing industry in Australia has invented literary sci-fi or literary speculative fiction. Can you just explain what yeah. that's supposed to mean? <laughs> to be honest, I don't fully know, <laughs> but I feel like it's a way to market things. I mean, I guess internationally, and I don't know that much about how things are marketed internationally. I'm sure some people watching this would know a lot more, but um, there's a clear way to market sci-fi and fantasy books in America, for example. Um, there's huge publishers of sci-fi and fantasy, and there's a way to brand them. There's a way to market them. There's a way to get people to endorse your book and get it into bookstores and get it on TikTok and Instagram and in you know, bookshops all around the country. There's a clear way that sci-fi fantasy books are sold and praised and lauded and um, you know, become bestsellers. Yeah. There's not that in Australia, I, I, th I feel. Um, and you probably know a lot more than me, Astrid, but there's no way for sci-fi and fantasy books here to get that sort of praise and attention. Um, and there's some really awesome things being written by you know, even in Melbourne, there's, you know, writers like Shelley Parker Chan and Vanessa Lan, who have, you know, have been nominated for awards, I, I've seen, um, but they've, their books are, have gone internationally. Yeah. So I would love to see that same love for speculative fiction here um, and less snobbery about fiction needing to be literary or not genre. <laughs> For it to be good because I think that the label of speculative fiction shouldn't be seen as I've had a lot of people go oh is your book sci-fi I don't really read sci-fi I don't read books set in the future that's just too far from what I can relate to I want to really show people that it can be very relatable and very powerful and also very empowering for both readers and writers I think a lot of marginalized and uh communities to take into speculative fiction because it is a very powerful medium for articulating their experiences of being um, unheard, unseen, uh, etc. And it's a, a real tool of uh, voice and empowerment for diverse and marginalised communities. So um, I really see that as being and I hope that that upswelling continues in Australia. Absolutely. I mean, you know, speculative fiction historically you know it's the literature of protest right like um if a writer is expressing interrogating a problem with society so often it is um uh that what if speculative fiction and um yeah uh we we, we have to work on the um publishing and marketing environment in australia grace um for <laughs> speculative fiction i mean think about it you know margaret atwood because ishiguro you know they often publish speculative fiction and no one like feels the need to justify that it's literary or anything. I mean, it's just assumed that it's going to be a, you know, a really interesting, probably great work and, you know, people will read it and buy it. Um, uh, it's kind of maybe an area of, I don't know, I'm being recorded, dare I say immaturity in the Australian publishing market yet that we need to work on. Uh, that's going to come back to, to bite me, I think. Um, so, uh, in your, like as a de debut author in Australia, like, what do you feel about the international publishing market and, you know, whether you want to um, publish into it or more specifically, like how as an Australian writer, you know, who's done really well with their debut long form work, how are you going to make that leap into the international market? If you want to, <laughs> leading question. <laughs> to be honest, I don't think a lot about where my book is going to go. <laughs> oh you're so, so lovely um, <laughs> I'm naive I think Astrid <laughs> I think I you know there's a lot going on in my life as medical work and there's writing and thing is very um it's very much a personal thing for me honestly mm. so it's something that I use to explore my thoughts and feelings about the world and about self and about you know things that are brewing away in my mind and my hope is that we'll connect with some readers somewhere. <laughs> um, 
I would love to see it reach an international audience. I mean, that would be a dream come true. Um, at the moment, I think that it's, I, I feel everyone kind of, every writer kind of needs to take a path that is suited to their own temperament and their skill set and their personality, right? So for me, my choice was to get people on side who could give me a bit of it experience and a bit of um uh kind of guidance in in the areas that I didn't have expertise in um I have a wonderful agent um and publisher here and um you know the fingers crossed you know if the book does well then we might try for an international market I think you know, we've had it at book fairs and it's gone over to New York and we, you know, hope that it might get some attention over there with the publisher, it's crossed. Um, but yeah, I think that for me, that was the way to go about it and just kind of release book to the, to the wild and see what kind of attention it picks up. And if it gets, um, if there is the chance to be, for an international publisher to pick it up, then obviously I'd be over the moon. Um, but yeah, I think it is really hard for us in Australia to publish internationally because Specfic in particular, getting into a market, a much bigger market like the US or the UK, um, I think the markets there are already oversaturated and they're only going to pick up a certain number of books of a particular kind. So Unfortunately, your book is going to be, I feel like my book is going to be put into a certain box. It's a sci-fi book. It's got, you know, Asian diaspora characters and all those labels that you don't think about when you're writing it, but they get put on it when it's marketed and their publishers are only going to want a certain quota of those kinds of books. So I do feel it is really hard to break into um, any, you know, any market really. I don't well, know, is that yeah. your kind of experience as well? Um, uh, it lines up with my observations. I mean, I'm not a writer myself, so it's not my experience, but it is it's absolutely um, my observations with, um, you know, what it's like as an Australian writer, even a really successful Australian writer, to move into um, the international markets. Often there's a perception of what Australian literature is, um, which doesn't really reflect the breadth of what we write and publish here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I wonder if we even get put into a box of, you know, is this international fiction? You can only publish so much. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> quite, quite possibly. Um, are you able to tell us what your next project is? Not with details, but like, are you working on other long-form work? Yeah, um, I'm juggling a couple of things. Writing-wise, I... I'm working on a couple of short stories um, and just kind of working up my momentum to start putting pen to paper for my second novel. <laughs> um, I would, I've got a second novel kind of brewing in my head and it's kind of at that stage where it's still good. It's like, <laughs> it's it sounds good in my head. <laughs> So I've got this idea for it, a science fiction novel, um, but one that hopefully will bl blend genres in, in many ways as well. So I'm hoping it'll be a, uh, a relationship portrait again. Yes. <laughs> um, grapple with some emotions that I've been thinking a lot about. So um, in particular, uh, the feeling of otherness, so the feeling of being othered by society and also the power of love um, and I guess a similar theme to every version of you but the the power of love and kind of makes a person um, what makes a person really and what what role love plays in that so yes it's sci-fi it might be set in space it might be far in the future um, but I'm also hoping to make it quite um, a close slightly claustrophobic uh, study <laughs> Yes, we'll see where it goes. Uh, well, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, read that uh, when you get it published, Grace. My final question to you is kind of um, about, um, you know, for the international audience, speculative fiction writers in Australia. 
you know, contemporary writers who are writing and publishing today, um, you know, who are two writers that the audience should know about from Australia? Oh, <laughs> oh no, I've given you only two. You can say more, but you know, who, 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 um, uh, yeah. the international people know about? Yeah. Oh gosh, you can, only two. <laughs> I did mention two earlier on in the recording, so I won't mention them again. But I have really enjoyed novels by um, I've enjoyed Angela Myers' work. Yes. Uh, Angela Myers, speculative fiction writer of <laughs> um, a superior and Munchaga. And also, um, oh, I have to toot the haunt of Else Fitzgerald. So her um, short story collection, um, Everything Feels Like the End of the World, um, was published last year. Uh, it is a remarkable um, emotional collection. Um, it will take you on a ride from the very near future into the very far future, grapples with themes like climate change very that's very much woven throughout the the stories and it's just lovely how the stories are so um they have such scope but there's a real thread that ties them all together there's a real thematic thread that ties them all together so that was Elf Fitzgerald everything feels like the end of the world oh such a such a wonderful book um Grace I really enjoy chatting to you Thank you so very much um, uh, for sharing your experience uh, with every version of you. Um, again, everybody, it's got an amazing fancy cover. Um, congratulations. Um, uh, and to thank end you so much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Grace. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you to David Writing and, uh, and the UNESCO City of Literature in Melbourne for organizing this event and for everybody watching today. Thank you so much. Thank you.